Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Social Work Bubble podcast. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Laura, a licensed master social worker here in New York. And today we have a special guest, Taylor, who will, talking, who will be talking to us all about finances, paying off debt, something that is really important for social workers. Thank you so much, Taylor, for coming on. Yes, thanks for having me. So excited to have this conversation. It's definitely, definitely needed in our community. Absolutely. I think the only things I ever hear about money and social work is that it's not there. So we, <laughs> right. we, have, all, we have all the debt, but none of the money to pay it off. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, we'll get into it in a second. Um, as we get started, Taylor, can you kind of introduce yourself to the listeners, kind of your journey in social work and what got you to this debt payoff place? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm Taylor. I am a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Oregon. I work in medical social work. And let's see, starting off with my journey in social work, I, for the longest time, didn't even know what social workers do, which Mm -hmm. I feel like is a common thing that we all come across. Uh, When I was in undergrad, I was getting my bachelor's in psychology, and then I was kind of panicking, like, what am I going to be able to do with my bachelor's in psychology? I already know. I knew I kind of wanted to be in the social services field, but I didn't know what that would look like. I also didn't think I would get paid very well with just a bachelor's degree. Yeah. Um, So I started, you know, exploring master's programs, but social work kind of came into my radar when I met this therapist. I I volunteered at this child advocacy center where we did forensic interviewing for... I love child advocacy centers. (laughs) Yeah, it was seriously, oh, just has a special place in my heart, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, you know, hard work, which we all do. We all do hard work and um, very just meaningful work. And so I met, we had a training uh, from a therapist who did therapy for the child, the children who, Mm -hmm. you know, came through our center. And I thought, wow, that would be so rewarding. And I would love Mm -hmm. to kind of be a part of that. So I, after the training, I talked around the side, I was like, Hey, like, how can I do this or work with you? Cause she had mentioned something about like, come intern with me. And she said, it's through the social work program at Portland state university. And I was kind of like, Whoa, that really, Then I went into a rabbit hole and Mm -hmm. into researching social work and just was able to learn that there's so many avenues, Mm -hmm. you know, that we can take as social workers. And that really resonated with me because at that time, you know, doing therapy in that with that population was interesting, but I also Mm -hmm. wasn't for sure if I wanted to do that. And so I felt like social work could really give me the skills and opportunity to you know, try many things. Um, mm-hmm. So pursued social work, you know, master's in social work. And um, I, before, so let me back up. I applied to four programs. Mm-hmm. And after I applied, I was getting super stressed out that I wasn't going to uh, get accepted, you know? So oh. it was just like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So yeah. I started trying to like build up my resume a little bit more in case mm-hmm. I needed to get a job. And so I found on Craigslist this volunteer position. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it was a volunteer position at this hospice agency and oh. it, they were recruiting for like patient volunteers. And so mm-hmm. I, signed up and went got this training and Mm -hmm. started visiting this individual who was receiving hospice services and um would just visit her weekly and you know provide some kind of social support to her and I really fell in love with hospice and end-of-life care and talking about death and dying and just Mm -hmm. being in that you know realm yeah and so uh, going into my master's program, I, my first practicum, um, was at a hospice agency. And then my wow. second one was at the veterans hospital. So I really kind of leaned into, mm-hmm. um, like the medical social work and I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, and then after graduation, you know, I was hoping for, we're going to start talking about money. There um, we go. 
<laughs> Here it is. Well, I was hoping for, you know, I didn't even have really a concept of what would be like a good salary, but I was thinking, yeah. you know, maybe mm-hmm. $60,000. That would be a really great starting salary, Sounds right? Sounds good. Sounds good. Sure. Yeah. So I, I went to school out of state and then came back and, um, mm-hmm. and applying to all these jobs and not really getting many responses I did interview at this community mental health center Mm. to be a mental health therapist and I ended up taking that job but the starting salary for that job was forty thousand dollars and that was really disappointing and that was in 2018 Mm -hmm. um so I remember calling my parents and being like my dad and my stepmom being like, do I have to take this? Like, this is so, this is yeah. so low. I feel like I have a master's degree. This doesn't feel mm-hmm. like an appropriate salary for, for the, you know, for this job, um, right. providing mental health services to my community. And I didn't have any other offers. So I was kind of desperate. So I took, mm-hmm. you know, took that job. Um, and, I've moved a few times throughout my career. So uh, I stayed at that job for about 13 months, moved to a different city, kind of transitions, life transitions with my husband yeah. and I in school. And um, so my second job I've had, I'm on my fourth job now out of uh, grad school. Mm-hmm. It's been five years since I've been um, out of school. Um, so second job, I was a hospice social worker, so I was like, dream job. Oh, I loved amazing. it. Yeah, I, I really, lo- yeah, like I was saying, I really love that work mm-hmm. and um, was able to get a, a little bit of a raise moving into that position. Yeah. I think um, at least on the West Coast, medical social work is, um, I feel like, a little bit a higher paying yeah. kind of field in social work. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like it's that way for I think so the too. East Coast? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I've seen in a lot of hospitals. And that's why I've seen, I think a lot of the people I went to school with to do like clinical social work ended up in hospitals or like in medical social work because of the money. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, go get it. That makes sense. I know, right? We got to pay our bills. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, so I stayed in that job for, for around the same amount of time, moved again, moved to a city where my husband's going to school, he's going to medical mm-hmm. school. Uh, so I got a job at a hospital, got a little bit of a raise there as well. Mm-hmm. I was doing discharge planning and working in the emergency department, doing behavioral health assessments. So that was that I started that job in 2020, mm-hmm. like fall of 2020. So definitely, you know, a lot of COVID. It was a small hospital, so mm-hmm. we didn't see, we didn't have a ton of cases of with, of people with who had COVID, but it still, still was very, it still was very prevalent and mm-hmm. hard and, you know, just not having enough beds for people who need them. And it was yeah. really stressful, but I, I did enjoy it. I think kind of, that was my most recent job, the mm-hmm. turning point of that. I was expecting to be there for a while, but we, my coworkers and I started, um, talking about, you know, our salaries amongst each other. And Ooh. we're starting to notice some um, pay discrepancies, uh-huh. which, yeah, was, I, I'm really proud of all of us that we were able to kind of be vulnerable and trust each other with that yeah. information mm-hmm. um, because, you know, it helped us feel empowered to, to come together and, you know, advocate for more, you know, we, we were exploring unionization because we were one of the lowest paying hospital systems in our area Mm -hmm. and union take like unionizing takes so long. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so we were just kind of like, how can we get what we want sooner? (laughs) You know, how can we, how can we get more money, um, you know, 
differentials for working in the evening, working mm-hmm. on the weekends, all these things that other hospitals are offering, other other hospital systems are offering. Yeah. How can we get those things? And so we came together and, and wrote this letter, demand letter, I, I would call it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, we have, there's like a paragraph of just our dissatisfaction and our, um, you know, current state of burnout and how we're hoping things to be improved. And then mm-hmm. we had a list of, I don't know, 15 or so things that we were hoping, you know, that could be changed. And Amazing. so, yeah, I'm, wow. it's, it was seriously so, I don't know, so powerful. It just was like, mm-hmm. this is, this is what we do as social workers. We advocate, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I don't um, think even, social workers listening would know that's an option, you know, because we think about like, okay, we can either like unionize or Mm -hmm. like we can talk to our supervisor about it, even though maybe nothing Mm -hmm. will probably change. But to have a letter of demand with a list, like that's strong. That's powerful. Oh my gosh. It was, yeah. I I feel like all of us just really felt so empowered. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, the collective, having more people obviously helps, you know, so we sent that off to our manager. We had, you know, she sent it off to administration and we had various meetings and, you know, with, her, with our manager and her boss and HR and, um, and, you know, essentially the message was, mm, this is just kind of how it is. It, it wasn't really, mm. it, it wasn't what we were hoping for, you know, no. and it was very, it was very disappointing. Um, you know, I, I remember one of the conversations was like talking about, you know, wanting us to reflect on why we came into social work and, you know, and it was, <laughs> it just, it just felt like Yikes. I need to pay, like, don't disregard mm-hmm. my need to be paid more, um, mm-hmm. by just trying to like call the conversation of remembering why we came into social work. And I know why I came into social yeah. work. Um, and one of my coworkers just kind of like shut that conversation down. I was like, this is yes. not the time to have this conversation about my values mm-hmm. and social work. And we're here to talk about our work life balance, our pay, our benefits. Mm-hmm. Like, not appropriate. Not at um, all. I see that a lot too with people I think that are wanting to go into private practice so that way they can have more financial independence where there's so much guilt on like, oh, but like I have to stay for my clients or like this is mm-hmm. more accessible healthcare mm-hmm. treatment. And it's like, okay, mm-hmm. you're also not going to change that system. <laughs> so, yeah. And you have bills to pay and loans to Absolutely. pay off. Like you do have Absolutely. to take care of yourself in that way. Yeah, absolutely. There's one um, person on Instagram that I follow who I really like. She does business coaching and she really preaches, you know, people getting paid their worth and also Mm -hmm. charging their worth. You know, if you're a business owner and just saying, you know, do not exploit yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, just don't. Why are we why are we exploiting ourselves? You know, like we we have needs and we need to pay our bills and, um, you know, and have, uh, just be able to live comfortably. We Mm -hmm. all deserve that, you know, but this, uh, this letter was not received, not received well. And there was Mm -hmm. a conversation towards the end where my manager essentially was saying that we're replaceable. Our, our social work department or so us as social workers, like, she's like, you know, you're replaceable, right? Oh my word. And, um, that was really, that was really shocking yeah. to hear and just, um, yeah, because we, as social workers, we, our department, we did all the discharge planning. And so mm-hmm. we were essential to the hospital. We were essential Absolutely. workers. So it just kind of that is what pushed me into searching for a new job and mm-hmm. cause I just didn't really feel supported and no. didn't want to continue working, you know, with someone who felt comfortable telling her staff that they were replaceable, mm-hmm. you know, it's just it's like, not leadership. <laughs> it's, it's not no. cultivating anything good in the workplace. Oh my God. Absolutely not. No. And she's a social worker also. So, <sighs> yeah. sigh. Yeah. I'm so glad you left that. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm working, 
uh, still in the medical field. I work mm-hmm. as a in the transplant, organ transplant field. So working with people who mm-hmm. are uh, their person is in the ICU and I'm talking with them about their loved one being an organ donor mm-hmm. and supporting them through that process. So I've been working here for uh, this month. It'll be, or last month was two years. I really love it. Wow. have great, yeah, have great managers and people who advocate without me asking for my pay mm-hmm. and are, you know, just really kind of cultivating just a healthy, healthy work environment. So really loving it. And it um, exists for social workers. It exists. Listening. It exists. It exists. I know yeah. my, uh, one of my, my old coworker, uh, shout out Dora. She and I worked at this hospital and we both came to this job together. Yeah. And so we started on the same day and we, you know, after one month, we're like, is this, is this a real place? Like, are we, what are we missing? Mm -hmm. They're like, there's just something, there's something off because this is too good. You know, like when is the other shoe going to drop, which Mm -hmm. is unfortunate. And I feel like sort of a trauma response of us feeling, you know, just not having good uh, experiences Mm -hmm. with our previous workplaces. And so I felt that same way when I like went to the job I'm at now, I'm in a private practice and I came from community mental health and, oh, (laughs) and I remember like (laughs) looking on Indeed for job for jobs and I came across the one for the job I work at now. And I'm like, that must be a scam. Like that's not real. <laughs> and I almost didn't apply to it because I didn't think wow. it was real. Yeah. What is it that, what is it that seemed like too good? Well, to at be the, true? at the practice I'm at, they specifically wanted like LMSWs, fresh graduates. You're able to like get all your supervision. You had a caseload of like a max of 30. And when I was in community what? mental health, I had like, 50 plus clients. It was insane. And the pay was so much better. There was benefits. I didn't have any benefits in community mental health. So like I was just going without insurance, just winging (gasps) it. I can't believe that. It was just so crazy. And what else? Oh, at this practice, they'll give you all the information you need to start your own practice and you can take your clients with you when you leave. That's wow. And it's, that's that's exactly how it is. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. How That's long have you crazy. worked there now? Um, t- almost two and a half years now. I actually just put in my stuff for my LCSW. So oh, as soon as I passed that, I'm leaving, but it's mm-hmm. been great. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I know. I feel like it's, it's been awesome to be able to share that story with our mm-hmm. story with other social workers that we know of. Like, yeah, it's, you can find it. Maybe you just need to come here. Like, we'll recruit you. (laughs) (laughs) But it's out there for us. And I I know it it feels it feels like a rare uh, Mm -hmm. story, though, unfortunately. Um, So then let's see. I'll back up just to December 2021. Mm. Um, I was working with my or I was at brunch with two friends and one of them brought up a high yield savings account. Mm. And for those of you who don't know, just high yield savings account is a savings account that has like 20 times higher uh, interest rate than our regular mm. savings account at our bank account in our, you know, the normal bank accounts that we have. So she, you know, told me about this savings account and I was just like, whoa, my mind was blown about yeah this concept of a savings account with a higher interest. Why haven't I not heard about this before? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of just went into this rabbit hole of like personal finance. And at that time we, you know, we have, we have a lot of debt. We still do, but I just learned, started learning a lot about personal finance and investing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I feel like I was, Someone who, and and it's okay if you're still this person or if anyone is this person, but I just had this feeling and mindset that like, I'm always going to have my student loan debt. Mm -hmm. It's always going to be there. Like, I'm just going to die with my debt. Yeah. And so (laughs) I started coming across people who 
were saying that they were paying off, you know, these large amounts of Mm -hmm. this large amount of debt and, you know, however much time and now they're debt free and, you know, just kind of sharing about their lives and how that debt not being there has just changed their lives in in whatever Mm -hmm. way. And so it was really inspiring to see like, oh, wow, I don't have to have this debt forever and Mm -hmm. maybe I can retire early. And so... Mm -hmm. Because it really is such Uh, a weight, you know, to carry knowing, oh, I have all of these things that are just there. And it's so mm -hmm. heavy. So so to know that there's a life where that doesn't have to exist is like, Mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, what? Absolutely. Yeah, it was it was so inspiring. And it made me want to start sharing what we are learning, what I'm learning through, you know, our personal finance journey and yeah. how we're paying off debt and, um, you know, especially in our social work community, just showing people that like social workers can be debt free. We can live happy, mm-hmm. you know, financially healthy lives too, but there's just not very many, um, examples of that. Yeah. So wanting to share, you know, just our journey and paying off our debt. So we started in May. May 2002 is when I like wrote out all of our debt, added it all up, and it was two hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars of there debt. There we go. <laughs> there it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so sh- you know, kind of sharing that this is how much debt we have. It's hard for anyone. It's hard for a lot of us to talk about the debt, you know, mm-hmm. that we have and our money. And so, just wanting to start a conversation about people not feeling isolated or, you know, just about having debt and knowing that Mm -hmm. other people have it too. And we'll, we'll get through this together. So I've just been blogging and, you know, I post on Instagram, my journey, uh, our journey of paying off this debt and what we're learning and Mm -hmm. personal finance tips that I'm, that I'm coming across that I feel like would be helpful to share with other people, especially social workers. Um, and so, yeah, so far, yeah, so far we paid off $40,000 of debt. So exciting. (laughs) Yes. And we still have 230, you know, 37 or so left to Mm -hmm. go. So, um, we, we've got, we've got a bit, we've made some good progress, so that feels good. And I think I've, I've come across a lot of people that it's have shared with me that it's been helpful for them to just read mm-hmm. and about, you know, our journey. And um, so it's been, it's been really good. That's amazing. What was your initial reaction when you kind of calculated how much debt you have? What was that like? Oh my gosh. It was even like you asking me that question. I can just mm-hmm. feel like stress, anxiety, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I think, I was avoiding it for a long time and and that's something that I think is important to just acknowledge and and talk about with, for all of us, regardless of how Mm -hmm. much debt you have, or maybe you don't have debt, but you just know your finances are not where you want them to be and kind of sitting down and confronting, you know, we, I feel like as social workers, we, we talked, Mm -hmm. we can talk to our clients about confronting this or confronting that. So (laughs) easily. So, yeah, kind of getting over that, <clears throat> that stress and not even getting over it, but just knowing that this is something that I wanted to work mm-hmm. through and something that I eventually wanted to be gone. But I it was stressful. And yeah. um, so it was mm-hmm. I think our our breakdown was um, about 17, 17 or so thousand of it was not student loans. So just Mm -hmm. like credit cards, we had a fence for our house and, you know, furniture, Peloton, a couple other things. If people are interested in like the raw numbers, I'm fairly transparent on Instagram and, and my blog about, you know, the breakdown of all of it. So people can go look if they're curious. Um, and then the rest of it were, were student loans. So right now what we're paying off is all student loans. So $230,000 of student loans. And it's a combination of my husband and I. Yeah. Balance. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it was stressful. I feel like I, that's the case for so many people too. Cause I did have a moment 
like I calculated how much debt my husband and I have, and it's like, oof. I want to say I think it was like $150,000 or something. I haven't looked at it again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's we need to do. But like the majority of it is student loans, which is so mm-hmm. frustrating. It's seriously so frustrating. I know. We could have a whole conversation about yeah. how ridiculous that is. <laughs> it's so much. But that's also, I think, very common for social workers, too. And so unfortunately, mm-hmm. part of the conversation is like you almost have to get student loans in order to get the degree that you need to get to get the job that you want to mm-hmm. get. But then you don't get the pay that you need to pay that off. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's really a lot. I feel like most of the social workers that I know, if not all of them, have student loan debt. And Mm -hmm. it's such a huge stress. And I think that's also something that kind of motivates me to in sharing this information and directly talking to social workers because... Mm -hmm. I have felt as I've gone through this journey and it's not over. I feel like my personal finance journey will be a forever thing. And I also try to remind people that like, just because I have this blog and this Instagram and I'm sharing, you know, the stuff that I am doing, I don't Mm -hmm. know everything. I'm still learning. Um, But through this process, I have felt a lot more empowered and not even related to finances, but just, I feel like it kind of overflows into other areas of my life because Mm -hmm. I feel I'm feeling more in control of like my finances and not feeling like they're controlling me and Mm -hmm. just kind of that internal transformation that I have felt. And like, I want other people, other social workers to feel this empowerment that I have, Mm -hmm. that I'm feeling because our jobs are so stressful and then we have our finances to deal with. And it's just, we don't always have like the mental capacity to, you know, put towards our finances. Um, So I totally understand that, but just kind of feeling how much it's changed my life. Truly. I'm like, I want other people to feel this way too. So absolutely. Absolutely. Now I know, I mean, when I've heard people talk about money, I hear a lot of like almost like cognitive behavior therapy stuff where they have to change your mindset. You have to change Mm -hmm. your relationship to money. Was Mm -hmm. that something that you experienced as well? What did that look like? Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's a good question. I think the relationship piece is, is a big part of it all. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, like I was saying earlier, just starting to feel like I'm in control of my money and it's not in control of me and that anxiety and stress, it's still there, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's happening less, you know, I feel it less often, which Mm -hmm. I feel like is a success. Um, But I also think just uh, believing in myself and that, I can learn, I can learn these things to, you know, change my circumstance. And I'm not saying that that's the situation or kind of mindset that other people, you know, just need to have just, um, yeah. Uh, Like I know all of our circumstances are different Mm -hmm. and you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. There are certainly some nonsense financial gurus out there that are just saying, Oh, well, you just view money negatively or just like, just, yeah. you know, like, and stuff that, yeah. okay, if that works for you, fine, <laughs> but everyone is so different. You kind of have to work through your own personal relationship to money in that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I feel like my personal relationship and my personal issue was that I didn't feel like I could learn it. And so, mm-hmm. you know, that was something that I needed to get over and just yeah. also kind of, really the confronting, confronting it Mm -hmm. and all the anxiety and stress that goes around that, I think is hard to kind of push through by yourself. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, knowing that there's coaches or there's people out there that can help you, you know, sit down and really look at the numbers because it is, you know, there's financial therapy out there for a reason. That's a, Mm -hmm. you know, a new kind of brand, not, I I feel like newish to me, but that is a branch of therapy, you know, for, for them to help people really Mm -hmm. like unpack their money traumas and beliefs around money and their relationship with money. And 
you know, at, yeah. improve their relationship with money. So I think, you know, not, not discounting the kind of mental, I don't know, impact that all of this Definitely. can have. Yeah. Cause yeah. it's hard. And like I was saying with us, having these stressful jobs that we have, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to find the time to kind of sit down and really just examine your finances. It's Mm -hmm. hard. And also I feel like finding people out there that you feel comfortable with, comfortable with learning from, you know, this is like the financial space is a very white male dominated Mm -hmm space so I feel like it's also you know intimidating to just be like yeah. uh I don't know I don't know who to go to I don't know who to look you know look to mm-hmm. to get this advice no one who's giving this advice looks like me yeah um so I think that's something that also helped me feel a little more comfortable just finding people in the space who their voice resonated with me and mm-hmm. they weren't they weren't, you know, spewing this like guilt and shame narrative, yeah. you know, I think that was, that was also a big mental hurdle or shift that I had to work through or still am just feeling this like guilt and shame for having mm-hmm. so much debt, you know, and yeah. getting into credit card debt and all of those things that make you feel like you're a bad person or bad mm-hmm. with money. And so just you know, kind of reframing those things and we're all doing the best we can. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, with where we are right now in the world, very normal to have credit card debt. <laughs> very normal it's to have any debt normal. at all. It really is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and knowing that other people, I think that's another thing that I've have slowly been realizing that the personal, the finance struggles that we have feel so isolating because it's yeah. one of those topics that we never talk about, like with literally anyone, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so starting to have a little bit more of those conversations with people in my life, it's, you know, validating. And also you can kind of, I don't know, build stronger relationships in that way of just being like, oh my gosh, you also are struggling with that. So am I. And it's also helpful to learn from those people too. But like, how do you budget? This is how I budget, you know, yeah. but our financial, the finance piece of our lives is just so, um, we just keep it really secret, you know, mm-hmm. and that can be really isolating when you're struggling. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think to your point, even earlier, like just when you were sharing with coworkers how much everyone was making, things come to light. <laughs> you know, you realize, oh, maybe mm-hmm. it's time to move on to something else or, OK, this isn't yeah. working anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that those conversations were so powerful because what kind of started all of that was one of our coworkers left to mm-hmm. a different hospital system. And she was like, hey, this is how much I'm making. And we were like, whoa, that's way more than, you know, some of us. And yeah. um, so then a few of us started kind of talking and it was like, wait a minute, how long have you worked here? You know, you're older than me and you've worked here longer, but I make more money than you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we were all very, it, it was, it's hard to have those conversations, but, you know, it definitely led us to that letter and and ultimately mm-hmm. I don't think I really finished that story because I just said I left but we were able to get in a, a tw- about a 20 percent increase in the social and social work salaries for every social worker in our hospital system in the state so whoa it was huge it That's was incredible. seriously 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 a huge success mm-hmm. um but it it all started with us feeling, you know, being vulnerable and transparent with each other Mm -hmm. about our money. So, and not saying that, just be vulnerable and transparent about your money with your coworkers and you'll get a 20% raise. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So in that, in that vein about like how much people are making, I think like we've talked about this, how social workers already kind of come into the field with these ideas, like you're not going to make any money. The pay sucks. Mm -hmm. It's just very normalized, kind of get used to it. 
for those that kind of hold that belief who are listening, how can you tackle debt when the money that you're making really does feel like it's not enough to cover everything? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. It's a big question. That is, I know. And I really wish, I really wish I had this, the secret to paying off debt Mm -hmm. and um, having a low salary, but I don't, I think, you know, a lot of people in the, in this personal finance space talk about, you know, cutting expenses Mm -hmm. and increasing your income. And I know that that always isn't like so easy to do. And I think Mm -hmm. if you feel like you're, you know, you've cut all you can, you're really looking at your budget and you're, and you're not overspending and you feel like I just, there's no room in this budget to pay off debt, then Mm -hmm. it is time to look for a new job. Like that's, that's okay. And I think us, you know, becoming, uh, becoming okay with leaving a job because we need Mm -hmm. more money. I think that's a mental hurdle that social workers have to have to go through sometimes when they, Mm -hmm because we really care about our clients and our organization. And if I leave, then who's going to see these people and I'm not in it for the money, but I need more money. And so I think it's okay to leave a job because you need more money. I think Mm -hmm. that is just, I don't feel like that is a a terrible reason to leave a job. And that can be the only reason that you need to leave. And that Mm -hmm. is okay. That is okay. Um, You know, I don't want to, I'm like side hustles. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. So I hate tough. to say that because it's like, we're already stressed and right. stretched and, you know, I don't want to, I'm trying to channel resting more personally yeah. in my but. life and not doing those side hustles. And so, but it's just, if the numbers, if they don't add up, they don't add up, you know, like mm-hmm. there's not much more that we could do. Um, you know, potentially advocating for, for more pay within your organization Mm -hmm. is, is possible, but also a process and can be timely and, um, you know, could potentially put stress on your relationship with your managers or other coworkers, you know, with, Mm -hmm. which is what I feel like kind of happened with me. So just knowing that that's something that can happen, but it can also be successful. So yeah. Yeah. It's it's a hard journey. <laughs> it really it really really is. Um yeah, I I wish that we we could be valued a little bit more than we do, but I also know that there are social workers out there that are making, you know, decent salaries and Definitely. me included. Um I recently put out this form this form to collect social work salaries. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And I, I kind of started cause I was just like, it would be so interesting to see, you know, what other people are making anonymously. Okay. Other people have asked me to share information about sal- social work salaries on mm-hmm. Instagram. And so I was like, yeah, let me make this form, gather some information, people's degree, how long they've been in the field, you know, like what, mm-hmm. where in the field they work and what's their salary, where do they live? And so I have this list of, I think it has almost 700 salaries now of okay. social workers across the country and That's also so cool. it's really really cool and there's also some who are a lot of people from the UK has put, have posted I'm in this like social mm. work, social work group with a lot of social workers from the UK so they've posted their salaries too but it's definitely it's really fascinating to get to see some actual numbers of people mm-hmm. who are working in the field you know and so seeing that there are definitely a lot of salaries that are low Mm -hmm. and it's you know it's like oh that that's the salary that we think of when we think of social workers but there are also salaries on there where you're like hell yeah Mm -hmm. you're you're killing it 
like so happy for you glad yeah. that you're getting paid what you deserve so i think um that link is in my bio and it's very it's it's a little encouraging to see because yeah. i feel like i there is this narrative that we're all getting paid terrible salaries mm-hmm. um and we're not but it can be hard to find those jobs too. So I totally get that. I think at some point I was asked by someone to, I didn't really have, I just wanted to kind of like share this and share Mm -hmm. it online. I didn't think that it was going to get this big. And so I'm hoping to kind of like organize the information and really see if there is kind of a trend or a specific field, you know, or a state that like, you know, maybe, maybe medical social workers, you know, that have filled out that form. It is true. Yeah. They're making the most or, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. just trying to see kind of like, what are the, the trends for our salaries? Cause someone who's in a master's program right now said it would be really helpful to know, mm-hmm. you know, when I start looking for a job, like, where should I be looking if I want, you know, this sort of mm-hmm. salary? Um, so yeah. yeah so interesting oh my gosh I do think too honestly I'm thinking about my own financial journey Mm -hmm. and I think like one of the bigger reasons I guess now that I'm thinking about it for me getting my LCSW is so I can make more money Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it's like there's only I don't know like back in the day I feel like a lot you could be a social worker with just a bachelor's degree and now it's just Mm -hmm. like increasing and increasing and so many jobs are like okay we're only hiring LCSWs. You have to have like an independent license. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, well, I'll do what I got to do. And that's kind of mm-hmm. been the thing that's like in those moments that are tougher. Like when I was in community mental health, I was only making $30 an hour. But with the no shows that I was getting, it was like I was getting paid <gasps> minimum wage because you only get paid oh based on if clients show up because I was fee for service. And I was still able to. I was still able to live <laughs> at that time. And so like you can make it work. And I was kind of just holding out for now when I do make good money and like private mm-hmm. practice. And so I think mm-hmm. also just like giving yourself time. Like I think as you build mm-hmm. experience, you do open yourself up to more opportunities where there is better pay. And it's annoying mm-hmm. that it has to be that way, <laughs> but mm-hmm. there are opportunities there. Yeah. So true. And then I also think about like, us having to invest the time and the money Mm -hmm. to get it to then make more money you know like that's hundreds and like I was looking I mean just the application alone just to apply to take the exam is almost three hundred dollars and then you have to pay another almost three hundred just to take the exam what (laughs) what are we doing I know it's ridiculous I'm like do they where do you think I'm getting this money from because it's yeah. And then, you know, the study materials, I think I probably spent around $300 or so. Yeah. Study materials and all that. But yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I know private practice is definitely a avenue for some people to kind of, you know, make the salary that they're desiring. And I've also seen that be, you know, if you have the time in your schedule and yeah. all of that. But my coworker, she opened up a private practice on the side and that's kind of yeah. like her, her, her side hustle. I think she makes about like a thousand or so a month. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, an option and she doesn't really have any desire to take it full time, but I know mm-hmm. that that could be. A nice starting point for some people where, okay, you have your guaranteed salary, you mm-hmm. know, and then kind of starting this on the side, building it up, which can take time, but can also be a way for people to make the money that they deserve to be paid. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm wondering just in terms of money. What is a, what does a balanced budget look like? For <laughs> I know that I've, it's a very personal, like it's person to person, but in mm-hmm. your experience, like what does that mean to you? Yeah, I think a balanced budget is I'm spending money on, I have money allocated for my needs mm-hmm. and my wants. So, and my debts. So those are kind of like my three like needs, wants, debts, and I think 
there's some people online who have this narrative that if you're in debt, then you can't have fun. Mm -hmm. You can't go out to eat. You know, you can't travel, do these things until you're out of debt. And that is just not a healthy, healthy way to live, I think, for for me and Mm -hmm. not many people that I know. So I feel like knowing your values and what you like to spend money on, you know, is it things, is it experiences, kind of making sure that you have some but some a line item for mm-hmm. things that you that bring you joy, you know, because yeah. we also need to enjoy our lives now. And I also know that budget, that word can be like a really mm-hmm. scary and concerning. And it was for me too. I felt like it would be restricting, but I've learned mm-hmm. that it's helped me. It's helped me reach the goals that we have set for ourselves in terms mm-hmm. of finances and has allowed me to spend on things that I want and not feel guilty about it, you know, because yeah. I knew, I know that I had this amount of money to spend mm-hmm. on a massage or yeah. a tattoo or whatever. I'm, I don't feel guilty that, oh, I could have maybe... I might have taken that money out of, you know, this line item or I shouldn't have spent that or whatever. So I feel mm-hmm. like it's helped me a, a relax a little bit with yeah. my spending. So Definitely. I mean, I feel like it's having just like a goal, you know, like to have a goal, like those smart goals we always talk about, like it's a good guidepost. So you actually know mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. works. Cause I remember when, when we were flying budgetless for a little bit, <laughs> I like took a look at, what we were spending just in a month and I talked to my husband I'm like how did we spend like $400 at Dunkin Donuts last month that's insane because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you just don't even realize because it's like a coffee here a coffee there oh let's oh, just really? run and get like a little treat and it's what yeah yeah and I think the kind of the the next step of the budget you know with with the budget, you're writing out that I'm going to spend this on bills, this on, you know, my mortgage, rent, whatever. But then that the next step is tracking your expenses and, mm-hmm. you know, subtracting it from the amount that you have allocated for groceries and figuring mm-hmm. out how much do you have left for your grocery budget. So you don't overspend. And I feel like that part of it, making a budget to me feels easy. Like mm-hmm. I'll just put my numbers in there but the hard part is like keeping up with yeah making sure that I am you know on track with those numbers it's hard for Mm -hmm. me to kind of conceptualize um and sitting down and tracking expenses I have continuously failed at it it's Mm -hmm. I feel like it's hard do you do do you what do you guys do it's very sporadic. <laughs> I have this thing where, like, every month, because I like to, like, look at the month ahead, try to make some mm-hmm. goals, and that's when I, like, mm-hmm. will review how we spent that month mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Does it happen every month? No. No, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. So, so sometimes, sometimes we'll play catch up, but, and then we try to categorize things, like, we have mm-hmm. the certain categories in our budget. I don't know if that's really created any change, <laughs> but we're, <laughs> But we're at least aware of like, okay, this is where the money is going. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think that's something that we we actually didn't even know when we started this journey of like, yeah. where are we spending money? You know, oh, we're spending more than we bring in this month. And I think that's, you know, a good place to start. One thing that's been super helpful for us is, you know, people talk about um, the envelope budgeting. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, okay. You take out a whole bunch of cash and you have this envelope for groceries, this envelope Mm -hmm. for eating out, you know, all your various envelopes for whatever you spend your money on. And then when the money in that envelope is gone, you can't spend anymore for that category. I don't like having cash. So we don't have physical envelopes, but I like to call them like digital envelopes. And so we have four different bank accounts um for our various categories so we just have 
one bank account for bills. We have one mm-hmm. bank account for food and like miscellaneous stuff. And then we each have our own spending account because my husband's in school. And so he's not making any money. And it's helpful for us to just both have equal amounts of, you know, we call mm-hmm. it kind of like our allowance for the month. And it also includes gas. So it's like, you can spend this on literally anything you want. No questions asked. Like Mm -hmm. we don't need to have a conversation about it. You know, I can buy all the plants that I want and he can buy all the golf stuff that he wants. (laughs) No one's judging. (laughs) Uh, So that I feel like I, 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 I tell everyone about this like digital, I call it the digital envelope budgeting method because mm-hmm. I'm such a visual person. And so it's helpful for me to, to look and we, we share all of the, uh, we're like co-owners on all of the bank accounts. So we can, yeah. we can share that we can see them all. And so, you know, like for our grocery budget, it's helpful to know. I can just open up my app and see how much money do I have left for groceries instead of me having to, track my expenses weekly mm-hmm. and it's just it's just hard for me to to keep up on that and some yeah. people they they really love that method but I've mm-hmm. just found it just doesn't work for me and I so I really love this like budgeting I love that because I've looked at like I've watched some videos on like the cash stuffing the envelopes and all mm-hmm. that and I'm like mm-hmm. I love this idea but same thing as you like I don't I don't ever use cash. I don't want to like have to deal with cash all the time. It's, but still having that broken up, I think is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And some people I've seen just start with one for bills and then Mm -hmm. spending. So like, you know, your spending would include groceries, eating out, kind of your variable expenses. And then the bills, you just have your, you know, bills account and, Um, so I know people that has, that has worked well for them Mm -hmm. in, you know, kind of getting a little bit more in tune with their finances and what's going in and what's going out. So highly recommend. I love that. Now, as we wrap up, what, this is a hard question again, but what's just like one piece of advice where social workers listening can kind of start or what can they take from this? Mm Mm-hmm. I think knowing, accepting that you are deserving of a salary that allows you to live the life that you want. Love it. (laughs) And, you know, I know we, we advocate so much for our coworkers and our clients and Mm -hmm. like that is like the, one of our core values, you know, advocacy. And so just, I really want people to, you know, advocate, advocate for yourself, advocate for your, your salary, whether it's in your workplace or leaving. Um, and if, if that is something that you're, you're wanting, it's okay to live. I'm giving you the permission. It's okay to leave your job for more money. Mm-hmm. Um, don't, don't make anyone, don't let anyone make you make you feel feel bad about that and you you can and are capable of learning about personal finance as well so you know just taking it slow and Mm -hmm. it's a lot to learn and it's going to be frustrating and you may have setbacks but just knowing that you can do it so (laughs) thank you so much taylor for coming on i feel like this is such an important and needed conversation now, for people listening, I know you have your Instagram, your blog, and everything. Where can they keep up with you? Yeah, so on Instagram, you can find me at Social Work to Wealth, and then my blog is socialworktowealth.com. So, like I was saying before, I'm very transparent with all of those numbers, and so if people are wanting to, you know, just kind of see our journey, and mm-hmm. it's it's there for you exciting well thank you everyone so much for listening um everything that taylor talked about will be linked below too and if you like today's episode like share comment do what you gotta do and we will see you next time thank you (laughs) 